Yep. Thank you very much, Helen. Can people hear me at the back? Because I shall talk at this sort of level. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, what I'm going to be doing, what I was asked to do, was actually to give you um, a sort of a prequel. Everything that we do, we're dealing with this weekend is the sort of modern work that's been going on along the river. What I'm going to be doing is giving you the background to that, what happened before. So when I started thinking about how I was going to do this prequel, I immediately went back to a paper I gave to uh, the Thames Archaeological Survey Conference back in 1998. So some of you may have been at that, in which case I apologise, because I'm going to be repeating quite a lot of what I said then. So if you like, this is a kind of sequel to the prequel. <laughs> now, let's make a start. Here we go. Now, to an audience such as yourselves, I don't need to stress how important the Thames is um, as a repository for lovely objects. Lovely objects, lots of them along the river, and a very large literature which is set about trying to explain them. Uh, and Bradley's book on the passage of arms is highly recommended. Quite old now, but still very, very good stuff. But what, I, what these sort of uh, publications don't go into is the story that lies behind the recovery of a lot of this data. So what I want to do is to take you back to the time before to actually look at how this material came from the river, the various ways in which it was filtered through uh, people like watermen, lightermen, uh, ballast getters, ballast heavers, uh, knick-knackatarians, collectors, museums. And I'm going to introduce you to a cast of heroes and villains, which, as I think I said in my blurb at the, at the, uh, uh, the abstract, would, would grace the pictures of our Dickens or Trollope. There's some really interesting characters here, such as people like Gaffer Hexham, who was a, a waterman in uh, Our Mutual Friend, Dickens' famous late novel, 1864-5. Hexham, part of his uh, livelihood, was uh, brought about by basically pinching things off suicides. He would fish bodies out of the river and empty their pockets. Uh, and that sort of piratical attitude to collecting along the foreshore is something that was very prevalent in the, particularly the 19th century uh, and in the early parts of the 20th century. Now, the golden age, we owe that phrase really to this gentleman here. This is George Fabian Lawrence. Um, now Lawrence, talking of piratical attitudes, Lawrence fits into that very nicely. Um, he's a sort of poacher turned gamekeeper who then becomes a poacher at the end of his career. He acted as an agent for both the Guildhall Museum and the London Museums at various times. This is him at work in the London Museum. Um, and it's through Lawrence's agency that very large numbers of very fine objects were recovered from the, uh, uh, from, not only from the Thames, but from the areas adjacent to it. Wheeler uh, gave him a very high accolade when he said that, but for Mr. Lawrence, not a tithe of the objects coming from the mud of London would have survived through to come into sort of museums and, and public institutions. Some of the objects that uh, Lawrence was responsible for include things like the, the famous London jug, the Tooley Street jug, Londini ad Farnum uh, Isidis, and of course uh, the Cheapside Hoard. Now, the Cheapside Hoard has a whole story of its own. It's a really, really interesting story. But Lawrence was acting at the time of its discovery for the London Museum. And of course, Cheapside lies within the purview of the Guildhall Museum. And he was going out, buying objects from the workmen in the local taverns and tap rooms, and taking them away and giving them to the London Museum, which went down like an absolute Led Zeppelin as far as the Guildhall Museum were concerned. And there was quite a foideur between those two museums on behalf of Lawrence. Um, who, in the end, uh, the London Museum was forced to make a rather sort of abject apology and return all the stuff. But it was due to Lawrence that we had it recovered. So he's a, he's a kind of, he's described as an honest rogue. Uh, and we'll meet him again a few times. He was a dealer at antiquities who had a little shop uh, on West Hill Wandsworth in his, in, his, in his latter days. 
Very, very interesting character. But he's the chap who, who coined the phrase the golden age of Thames finds, because writing in 1929, he said that he feared it was past. So if we look at what would define the golden age, here's Lawrence writing in about 1929, probably at the behest of Wheeler at the London Museum. And this very neatly, I think, sets out what he would regard as the golden age. Writing in 1929, he's thinking about a period perhaps 40 or 50 years earlier, which made up this golden age, dating from the sort of 1830s, late 1830s, 1840s, up to about the end of the century. And there are very specific reasons for dating it to that period, um, and we'll come back to uh, one of those in a minute. Uh, nicely bracketed, of course, by the discovery of the pentadrian and the so-called uh, Q tankard. Now, just a quick excursus, the river bodies... Oh, well, yes, before, I, before we get into river bodies, we might just point out that the Golden Age, OK, was a mid-19th century thing, but there were finds being made along the river, along the tideway, much earlier than that. And we have a very nice reference uh, from this uh, uh, parliament roll, uh, parchment roll, um, held at Isleworth, uh, a court session held at Isleworth, 19th of October, 1467. Well, you can all read what's going on here. John Rouge of Isleworth is forced to declare the finding of a gold talk weighing 50 shillings to the Abbess of Sion. The Abbess of Sion acted for the Crown in matters of treasure trove in the West London area. So basically, Rouge declares, his, declares the finding of his talk, which is promptly confiscated from him, melted down, uh, and turned into shillings of, of, of uh, its worth in shillings of silver. Um, the actual weight of the talk, this is the Moulesford talk, and this weighs about a pound of gold. That's the sort of equivalent weight which would uh, make you 50 shillings of sterling silver uh, in 1467, or the equivalent of it. So we've got a long history of fines, but it's only towards the latter end of the 18th and 19th centuries that they come down to us in the records. River authorities, here this fine body of men. This is the, uh, I think this is the Draper's Company, uh, Swan Uppers, uh, one of the two, of the two London companies who are allowed to go swan upping. Um, these chaps, this particular gentleman here with his swan feather and his cap, is sitting on the London Stone. This marks the upper end of the City of London's jurisdiction in the Thames. Uh, as Fred Thacker put it in his classic Thames Highway book, um, it was strict as far west as Staines and vague and doubtful beyond. So the Corporation of London claimed jurisdiction over the Thames as far west as Staines. They bought that concession off Richard I in 1197. He'd come back from the Crusades, potless. The city bought this concession off him for 1,500 marks. They then controlled the river uh, from about the, the latter end of the 12th century down to the middle of the 19th century when the Thames Conservancy uh, were launched. Alongside uh, other bodies like uh, the uh, Trinity House, who provided pilots uh, and uh, life boys and lighthouses and undertook a lot of the dredging. Dredging is something we'll come back to in a tick. Here's the, uh, here's the second authority we need to take account of. This is the Port of London Authority who were set up in 1909, they were given jurisdiction over the tidal Thames. So after 1909, you had two authorities. You had the Thames Conservancy who dealt with the sort of upriver, and the Port of London Authority who dealt with the downriver, the tidal Thames. And those of you of a certain age, like myself, will probably realise that the uh, Teddington Lock here was the scene of the infamous fish slapping dance. <laughs> Uh, which, I, which, I, which I rather like, and uh, I aim to get this slide in at every occasion. <laughs> anyway, now dredging is crucial to our understanding because these river authorities were charged with maintaining the navigation. And maintaining the navigation meant dredging out the channels, uh, removing obstructions like fish weirs and flash locks, maintaining the embankments. So river authorities had quite a series of responsibilities. But 
absolutely first and foremost was maintaining the navigation. Maintaining the navigation meant dredging the river, keeping it free of gravel and silt. And it was done by two methods, uh, the first of which is the spoon and bag method by hand. These two chaps are working just upstream of Reading Bridge as late as 1930s with what looks like a sort of enlarged um, children's fishing net, which this gentleman is going to push down into the foreshore, but push down into the riverbed and pull up by brute force, tipping it into the lighter. That's one way of doing it. It's a slow way. And the other way is by steam. And after the middle part of the 1820s, after some very, very encouraging uh, work in hull docks, river uh, steam dredgers were brought into the Thames. And they've got lovely names like Goliath, uh, Goliath, Hercules and Samson. And these sort of machines could remove something like 20,000 tonnes of gravel from the bed of the river, which was then loaded onto lighters, taken over, and then loaded by hand by the ballast heavers here into the holds of seagoing ships, many of which were colliers. Uh, and a lot of this Thames ballast found its way back up on the River Tyne, up to the northeast coal fields. It went back up, stiffening up these ships to make the return journey up the east coast, whereupon, once the ships docked at Newcastle, they loaded, offloaded all the Thames ballast onto the foreshores along the Tyne, so that the Tyne commissioners were forced to redredge the Tyne <laughs> of Thames ballast. Uh, and a lot of this clearly was going on very early, because the 13th century river walls uh, of Newcastle along the, along the Sandgate and the Swirl down on the south side of the river uh, seem to be founded on deposits of dumped Thames ballast. So this is a pre-13th century manoeuvring of, uh, of Thames ballast. So dredging is important. The other thing that's particularly important, because we can be rather more specific about location, dredging is a bit of a blunt tool. Um, those of us who've had to deal with Thames finds will know that a lot of them are simply marked Thames Brentford or Thames Isleworth, which might mean anything between sort of Kingston and Kew, depending on where the ballast heavers, where the ballast getters were working. Um, and they usually work quite long stretches. So it's quite difficult to pin them down. It's much more interesting and much more secure when you're dealing with a specific programme of work. Uh, and the big programme of work that kicked really everything off in terms of London and its uh, recognition of its own past was the removal of old London Bridge um, from the sort of 1830s, 1840s into the 1850s. This is the old Cold Church Bridge with its 19 arches, which essentially provided a dam or a weir. Uh, this picture on the right, which is uh, an early watercolour by Turner, um, shows the, we're looking on the upstream side of London Bridge, across to St Magnus and the, uh, and the monument, but you can see the change in water level as the water is coming through on the incoming tide. There was a change of up to a metre in water level. A lot of people tried to shoot the rapids at this point, uh, and it's said that London Bridge was uh, a place where wise men went over and fools went under. <laughs> a lot of London apprentices drowned trying to shoot the rapids. Pepys, of course, was, was far too canny for that. He got his waterman to take him in on the upstream side. He got out and walked round and rejoined his waterman after he'd shot the bridge. So he knew a, th a thing or two. But the interesting point about this, of course, is it was a major, major obstruction which had to be removed. And this is a fabulous image by George Schaff from the 1840s, which shows the new London Bridge. Here's the new London Bridge on the downstream side with Southwark Cathedral over on the far side and old London Bridge, which is in the process of being removed, being dredged out. Uh, and it was uh, clearly a matter of great concern to the watermen and the river users, because as Boz says, Dickens says in his uh, short story, Scotland Yard, they were very worried that removing the river, removing the bridge rather, would simply allow the Thames to run away and they would lose their trade. So that was a very real fear. Now, right on the doorstep of London, right in the heart of the capital of empire, 
you have a major opportunity for the recovery of objects as this old bridge is removed, and not surprisingly, quite a lot of antiquarians found their way down there. Um, and this gentleman, um, the one on the right, um, is one of the key players. This is Charles Roach Smith, who was a, a London druggist, um, who was very keen. He, w he was a, a mover and shaker, basically, in making sure that London's archaeology was properly recorded. Uh, and he made himself a real nuisance to the city corporation, such that they actually um, had his house demolished in a road widening scheme. Um, he was forced to move um, and, as a result, took again the corporation, as you would expect, and ended up selling his extensive collection um, on his retirement to the British Museum. So the uh, London Museum and the Guildhall Museum missed a very, very great, great trick by upsetting, uh, by upsetting uh, Roach Smith. Anyway, this is one of a number of the finds that he recovered from that London Bridge episode. Uh, he also took the trouble to row, hire a boat and row himself out into midstream to actually watch what was going on. And he was on hand to pick material literally out of the lighters as it was being dumped into the lighters by the dredger crews. He was there to recover the material. He also enlisted a whole series of what he described as juvenile auxiliaries who followed the dredgers and followed the, the, the lighters taking the dredged material away and dumping it on the foreshores, upstream and downstream of the city. Uh, and he recovered quite a lot of information as a result of that work. Uh, these, these juvenile auxiliaries would bring him coins and other finds. So he's a very, very important player uh, in the story. Another important player who also took direct action was Henry Sire Cuming of Cuming Museum fame. Onto the London art market in the middle part of the 1850s, a whole series of finds began to emerge. Lots and lots of human skulls, lots and lots of high quality uh, weaponry, Bronze Age swords and later swords, and the Battersea Shield. It had no provenance. That wasn't good enough for Sire Cuming. He decided that, as he says here, by dint of vigilant inquiry, and the employment of means, which it's not necessary to detail. <laughs> he actually went out and found where this stuff's coming. Basically, what he was doing was, was loitering around the tap rooms in the sort of Chelsea area and talking to the workmen as they came off shift, buying them pints and plugging them for information. And it became very clear that uh, the Battersea Shield had been found on towards the Middlesex bank of the construction of the, the Chelsea Bridge in probably 1854-1855. It was sold to the British Museum by Henry Briggs for 40 quid. So 40 pounds bought you the Battersea Shield in the middle part of the 19th century. Cuming was quite a, quite a, a tough cookie. He, there was no flies on him at all. He was not taken in, here he is, he was not taken in by the Billies and Charlies episode of the mid-1850s, 1857, 1858, where two as it turned out, two illiterate shore rakers, uh, Billy Smith and Charlie Eaton, were turning these out in a workshop <laughs> on, um, uh, by the Tower of London. Well, using well-tried and tested means, Cuming bribed a competitor to break into the workshop and nick the moulds. <laughs> so it became very clear that these people were turning these fake things out and selling them by the thousand. Um, the interesting point about these, of course, is they've become highly collectible. <laughs> these mid-19th century facts are now highly collectible. You now see fake Billies and Charles. <laughs> we had a whole bag full brought into the museum just towards the end of my time there, which had been found under a hedge in Essex. <laughs> Whether it was from a house break-in, or we, we don't know. But, um, but very, very interesting group of stuff. Now... That left a lot of egg on a lot of faces because a lot of people were sucked into this and bought this stuff. Five, oh, blimey, right, I've got to go. Oh, enough of that. There's a whole lecture in itself there. I've, I've got to go. Um, who are the people who are actually trading this stuff? Well, there's a whole l vast amount of information required to really get to grips with this. But get, we're back to Dickens with the old curiosity shop. Um, the dealers in exotic trifles and shells 
were often known as Nicknacketarians, which is where the phrase Nicknack comes from. Um, they were the ones who were out buying, acting as the middlemen. They were buying this stuff and selling it on. And this is the sort of uh, leading to sort of pictures like this. This is, this is E.W. Cook's uh, fabulous picture in the V&A, for which I'm afraid I don't have copyright, so... Um, <laughs> ah, um, <laughs> this might have to get excised. But anyway, this is Cook's fabulous picture, The Antiquary's Cell, painted in 1835, which shows a gentleman antiquary's cell. This is a collector who basically defines himself by his collection. All you're missing from that picture is the collector. Well, there he is. This is Richard Cuming. This is Henry Sire's dad. And this is him surrounded by part of his collection, which is now in Southwark. Right, I've got, I've got to move. Um, two very, very important collectors, two big figures in that London antiquities market in the 19th century, Canon William Greenwell of Durham and Thomas Leighton of Kew or Brentford, actually. Leighton, obviously, uh, Greenwell was a cleric, but a piratical collector, ferocious collector, hated to be bested in the marketplace. And this austere portrait of him in Durham Cathedral Library makes it very clear he was not a man you'd mess with lightly. <laughs> He's fingering that spearhead with every intent of doing damage. Leighton, of course, was a collier, uh, a coal merchant, both men were uh, uh, elected to the Society of uh, Antiquaries of London on the same day. They were great friends. Um, in fact, Leighton supplied the uh, Society of Ants with its coal. And there's quite a lot of correspondence between the Mr. General Secretary at the Society of Ants and Leighton, where the General Secretary is complaining about the quality of the coal that fellow Leighton is selling him. Now, Leighton is a big collector, really big collector. Greenwell, though, was outraged by the splitting up of a very, very important horde of spearheads dredged out of the river at Broadness in 1892, which was divided into three bits, three parcels. One parcel was bought by Greenwell, one parcel was bought by William Lloyd of Twickenham, and the third parcel was bought by Frank Corner of Poplar. And it was only very relatively recently that those three have been put back together again. Two of them are in the Museum of London and in the Museum of, uh, of London's Prehistoric Gallery here. The third bit is still with the BM. Now I've got to crack on. Um, here is a quick bar graph of Thomas Leighton's collecting. He was a very long-lived collector from the 1850s, virtually through to the time of his death, 1911. But there's a very interesting spike in his collecting. In the 18, uh, late 1850s, early 1860s, there's a very particular reason for that, because it was at that time that Brentford Dock was being constructed. This linked uh, Brentford uh, and the Thames with inland industrial Britain. And it was said at one point that something like 10% of the nation's trade went through Brentford Dock. But it's during the construction of Brentford Dock that very large numbers of bladed weapons were found, in particular Bronze Age uh, weapons, and also Saxon weapons. And John Clark has been looking at the Saxon end of it, um, and I've been considering the sort of Bronze Age end of it, but I haven't got time for that now. We've got to move on. If we move upstream, another gentleman collector who's rather less well, well, a lot less well known, is William Roots. Dr. William Roots, um, who was uh, always noted for dressing in an antique style. And I think you can see that here. Now, he was very much involved in the dredging of the river for the construction of new Kingston Bridge. His old Kingston Bridge, as excavated by Jeff Potter back in the uh, 80s and 90s, his new Kingston Bridge, which was initially put up in the 1820s, and which produced large numbers of objects as it was being constructed. Um, these are all assumed by Roots and other local antiquarians to be Roman. So here was the site of the great Caesarean Ford of BC 54. Uh, forgetting, of course, that there are about six other sites that claim to have Caesar crossing. These, of course, have all disappeared. We don't know where these are. These are, uh, these are the only record we have of these objects. Clearly, most of them are Bronze Age. These two, those two are Bronze Age. This is medieval, and that is probably Civil War pennant from a, from a, a, a flag or standard. One minute. Okay. I'm with you. Now, 
One real tragedy, there's lots of tragedies, but one real tragedy is the loss of the Frank Corner collection. Not so much the Frank Corner collection, but the Frank Corner collection catalogue. This was sold at a sale, as you can see here, at Puttick and Simpson in 1948. What Puttick and Simpson hoped to do was to sell all 81 lots with, uh, with Corner's manuscript catalogue as one, one lot. They couldn't. They had to split it up into 81 lots. Somewhere out there, we know not where, is a lot of objects from the Thames accompanied by Corner's manuscript catalogue. We've tracked down a number of these various lots, two or three in the Museum of London. There's some more in the Croydon Natural History and Scientific Society collection. One turned up in a, in a school loft in the Wirral, uh, bizarrely. Uh, and the late... Um, uh, oh, anyway, so Enfield also, there's, there's some others turned up there. But it's the loss of that catalogue, which is extraordinarily damaging. Uh, the shield, by the way, ends up in the uh, Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto because Corner sold it direct to the museum in the 1930s. Other material from Corner and other collections was obviously sold on by Lawrence. Now, second golden age. Erosion, erosion, erosion. Archaeology, archaeology. Lots of recording needed. Lots of recording being done through the Portable Antiquities Scheme. People like Andy Johansson here with his fabulous early Iron Age dagger in a wooden sheath. Gus and the Frogs and the TAS and the TDP and Citizen all making contributions. This is the new golden age. We're now beginning to contextualize these finds, which those antiquarians back in the 19th century weren't quite so interested in. We're now getting provenance, context, location, that sort of stuff. This slide, again, no copyright, um, is an aerial view of that important bend of the Thames just coming up to Vauxhall. And there are three major programmes at work here on this one slide. First, of course, we've got the Battersea Channel project down here, which is a collaborative project. We've done a lot of, a lot of the local units uh, looking at the topography and the hydrology of that area. We've got the Tyburn project over here, Virgil Yendel and others putting together information regarding the archaeology of the Tyburn stream. And we've got the Thames Tideway Tunnel project, who are working sort of downstream of Vauxhall Bridge here in an area where we know of wooden structures of Bronze Age and earlier date. So there's three major collaborative projects there on that one slide, and that is going to be the way forward. My last slide is thanks to James Robert Wells, Bob Wells. Some of you will know Bob, or will have known Bob, um, who died back in July after a long battle with cancer. Now, Bob always described himself rather dismissively as, as an old ex-copper. And I thought, well, I wonder what an old ex-copper means. Well, it turns out he was chief superintendent of the firearms section, D11, of the Met Police. And he was the first person through the window in the Balkan Street siege when the IRA were holed up in a flat, for which he was given the Queen's Award for Gallantry. So here, if anywhere, I've talked about heroes and villains through this last few minutes, here is a true hero. He will be missed. Thank you.